the October 18th uh, meeting of the Clean Water Board. I'm going to keep my welcome very short. We're um, trying to squeeze in a little bit of extra public comment, which I think is always a noble goal. Um, so I won't rattle on for too long. Uh, the main item at the beginning here is to to just put it out there for members of the board. Um, are there any edits or comments for the February 8th meeting minutes? And uh, either speak up or raise a hand. And if there are none, we will consider those meetings adopted. These meet those meeting minutes adopted. So pausing briefly. Seeing no hands and hearing none, um, those meeting minutes are good to go, Emily. Um, so I think, generally speaking, Emily, you just take us through the rest of the agenda, and we can uh, we can get moving so that we get that extra public comment in. Excellent. I'm just going to update my screen share, and then we will get going with our presentation. There are a few slides that are also posted on the Clean Water Board meeting web page for today's meeting. Jim has a hand up. Oh, Jim, did you have your hand up? Yes, I wondered if we could add to the agenda the minutes we just approved, talked about uh, reporting back of the conversation on the program audit with the legislature and just if we could spend two minutes on what happened with that. Uh, yes, apologies. I was just trying to remember. Um, the, the results of the conversation with the legislature, as I recall, uh, it was a couple months ago at this point now, but and so apologies for the delay in getting information back to people. The results of the conversation were that, um, you know, we we published an RFP, we did not get any responses, and we had opened ourselves up to legislative suggestions and, and talked about how it would be necessary um, to narrow the scope of the RFP and statute in order to to really get there. So. Um, we didn't come out of that conversation with the legislature with with any solutions or any any um, legislative change to the the required scope of that audit. So at this point, I believe we are um, still a little bit stuck in the mud and in having an RF, having a required structure that we know we've tried multiple times now to get responses to. Um, so I don't think we've we've been able to achieve progress in that area. Is that all fair, Secretary Moore? <laughs> yeah, I would I would ag agree with that assessment that we we asked for advice based on the fact that we issued the RFP two if not three times with no success, um, and didn't really receive any uh, specific direction from the, the legislature other than an acknowledgement that what we said was true. <laughs> There will be a February 2023 board meeting to address some other business uh, that's not directly related to the budget. And I wonder if that would be a good um, time to touch base on next steps. Yeah. OK, yeah. so we will um, be sure to include that in the February board meeting agenda. Thank you, Jim. OK, um, shall we start to roll through the agenda? So we have some supplemental slides that are posted on the web page just to help bring everyone through the content today. Uh, we're going to kick off with my colleague Gianna Petito, our grants coordinator, to give an overview of this year's clean water budget process. Thanks, Emily. So hi, everyone. Welcome today. So this is an overview of the process timeline today, what we've done and what we need to do to move it forward. We are currently here in that bolded rectangle, the October 18th Clean Water Board meeting. Leading up to this meeting, the Emergency Board adopted a consensus revenue forecast in late July for the Clean Water Fund. And so we use that to inform budget targets and worked with an interagency work group to develop the draft budget that's in front of the board today. 
After this meeting, we'll move forward with the public comment period. My colleague, Rachel Woods, is going to provide more information about the structure and content of the public comment period. But just for your awareness, it's October 24th to November 22nd. And then the next Clean Water Board meeting will be on November 2nd. That's also going to be the public hearing date. Um, at the close of the public comment period in late November, we'll work on summarizing what we heard and present that to the board on December 7th. So the board will reconvene in December 7th, take note of the public comment, make any other adjustments to the budget as decided, and then send over the final budget recommendations to the agency of administration. There may be some work in middle December to um, do some updates to the budget language in the Clean Water Fund and Capital Bill for different agencies, just to align with what the board's final recommendations are. And then, as you all know, in January, the, the governor makes his recommendation into the legislature for the full budget, and the legislature may take uh, testimony between January and hopefully April or May, and then have a budget approved for us to work and go live July. And then the last thing to flag for you all is the February date it hasn't been set yet, but it is bolded. As just mentioned by Emily, we will have a reconvening to review what the governor proposed, see if there were any changes, and some other. Um, an agenda item from there. <laughs> so I'll pass it over now, I think, to Nick Kramer to present on the operating statement. Yes. Um, and I'm going to update. Let's see. Nick, are you here? <laughs> yes, I am here. Hi, hey, Nick. Hey, Excellent. guys. Hey, everybody. I'm, gonna... I'm happy to Welcome share in. my screen if that's easy. I don't know if I have permission here. Maybe I think that's the easiest thing to walk through this operating statement. So. Let's see. That would be great. Um, finagle this. So Nick is going to be walking us through the Clean Water Fund operating statement that's updated twice a year to reflect updated revenue projections. And welcome Nick to this group. Uh, Nick is the new budget analyst at Agency of Administration that is supporting the Clean Water Fund budget process. Thank you, Nick. All right. Thanks, Emily. Um, so hey, hello, everybody. Good to be here. Uh, I'm gonna, I know we have limited time today, so I'll try to be fairly brief walking through this. Can everybody see the screen OK? Um, looks like, yeah. OK, so um, I think the, the headline really from this operating statement, which is dated 10-4, uh, but is really reflecting data shortly after the close of the fiscal year, is that in FY22 and FY23, we had pretty significant um, surplus above uh, expectation for the Clean Water Fund. So I don't know if my cursor is visible. I, if I can direct everybody to the fifth column here, actuals for FY22, you can see that the clean water surcharge, we came in a little bit over $12 million, opposed to an anticipated uh, 8.2. There's a nominal amount of interest income. Um, the bottle is sheets, which are sort of notoriously hard to track. Our colleague, Aaron Hicks-Tibbles, who's also on the call, has been paying some close attention, but those were also up a little under a million dollars and the meals and rooms tax as well um, from 11.8 up to 13. So you can see in line G in total, we went from anticipating about $22.9 million in total revenue to uh, an actual of 28.7, which um, is obviously great news. We could talk for a very long time about why uh, that surplus came in. I am not an economist, I just parrot them. Um, I think the the high level uh, summary is just as the federal stimulus money continues to trickle through our, our state economy and we see sort of the in, um, stimulated effects of that with meals and rooms tax, you can imagine as COVID started to wind down, there was more activity in the tourism uh, sector. Some of those receipts were higher than anticipated. Like I said, bottle of sheets, all we can say for sure there is that people are hanging on to their returnables uh, more than we expected. So if you scroll down, or I guess it's already here on the screen, um, that extra $6 million shows up at the very bottom line. That's row double C there. You can see in January we were anticipating about $5 million of surplus. In actuality, it's going to be about 10.8. Um, so that's that very uh bottom line then in 2023 fiscal year 2023 the same effect carries through uh again I, I maybe won't spend time going line by line but you can see across clean water surcharge 
the the sheets and meals and rooms, all of those revenue projections are, are slightly increased from where we were in January. So that all shakes out in line G to an increase of a little bit over $3 million, um, which again, now skipping down to the very bottom line, double C for FY23. Um, if as budgeted, we were anticipating about $2.7 million by the end of the current fiscal year in surplus. But if you combine the 6 million of additional surplus in FY22, with the uh, additional three million in FY23, that's actually that number climbs to almost twelve million dollars. Um, so that's again great news for the Clean Water Fund. I think if you look at FY24 and FY25, however, you see a trend that we see across state government um, that, namely, that we it's we really can't consider those one-time uh, surpluses to be ongoing. If you look, for instance, at the line G of FY, or uh, column G, uh, line G of FY24, the uh, overall revenue is anticipated to decline a bit, and that continues into FY25. That's, uh, again, to pair at the state economists here, as the some of the federal stimulus money works its way through the system and our, our economy returns to its underlying fundamentals um, we just can't be sure that we will see the kind of elevated revenues that we've been seeing recently. So those are conservative estimates for now. We're living in unprecedented economic times, um, but I think it's safe to say that for the purposes of thinking about appropriations, um, those FY22 and 23 windfalls may not be ongoing, and that obviously has implications for how this board elects to spend uh, those monies. So, and I, I believe Emily and others are going to speak more to that. I'm happy to answer any questions on this sheet, um, but maybe I'll leave it there and, and see if there's any points of clarification. Question. I don't know, Nick, if it's best put to you or Emily, and apologize for not knowing it, which is the property transfer tax is scheduled to sunset at some point. Does anyone know what fiscal year that is? Um, I, I can go ahead, Emily. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I, th I think I, the last I recall seeing in statute, there was a, a threshold at FY27. Um, I'm not sure if that's a complete sunset. It seemed like the rate is pretty significantly knocked down, but somebody closer to, to the statute may know better than I. Oh, right, because a portion of the property transfer tax, I believe, now goes to VHCB, the first that's, that's allocation right, of it, yeah. maybe to pay the housing bond. And so exactly. maybe it's just that portion remains after FY27. All right, that's just an important, I think, point of reference for everyone to have. So it doesn't affect anything we're seeing um, in terms of the, the current or the next two fiscal years, though. So. Right. Thanks for yeah. that flag. We will definitely dig into the details of that and make sure it's kind of on our planning horizon looking forward. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Any questions sure. for Nick? Not right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. So next up, we have our presentation of the draft state fiscal year 2024 clean water budget for the board's consideration. I'm gonna pull up my uh, PowerPoint slides again for us to go through here. Bear with me a moment while I get these into the full screen. Um, and my colleagues Gianna Petito and I are going to be sharing this presentation. So uh, we'll walk you through um, these slides, and the materials are also in well, also in the budget materials, I should say. Uh, so Gianna, would you like to pick it up? Thank you. So we're going to talk both about the full budget recommendation and the drafting approach, and we may switch back and forth between the two of them. And we'll try to highlight for all of you what is the same from State Fiscal Year 23, what's different and why some of the reasoning behind that. So to start off with, this is the simplified budget um, budget view. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> um, and there are four columns leading up to the $50.6 million that's currently being proposed in this budget. Uh, there's the $25.7 million for the Clean Water Fund, which is roughly equal to the projected state fiscal year 24 revenue that Nick just presented on. 
There's a new column that is an additional $4.9 million, also in clean water funds. This is um, a proposal to use 10.8 of the total unreserved unallocated and take a portion of it into this year. And my colleague Emily will present more information and details onto the reasoning behind that. So this is going to be couched as one-time funds. There's a 10 million in projected funding from the clean water section of the clean cap the capital bill. And then this is the final year of $10 million in the American Rescue Plan Act dollars that were appropriated into the clean water budget. So we're going to walk through this budget sheet. It's on page six of the meeting materials. We apologize in advance that on the slide it looks quite small. Our, our effort throughout this presentation is to highlight in yellow where to draw your attention. You may not be able to read it on the slide, but hopefully you can read it on page six of the meeting materials. Um, and before we jump into that, the other thing to flag for you in the collection of meeting materials starts on page seven. This is the, the clean water budget overview document. It will be a standalone PDF that will be available on the clean water board website. But it's really useful for board members and also the general public. It provides a background on the clean water budget, the timeline for how it gets developed, both the simplified and detailed budget. This is the detailed budget sheet, um, a narrative of the budget approach, budget drafting approach. So what we're going to present on today, it is written down somewhere. The reasoning that we'll be walking through and then descriptions of each line item, basically explaining what it is these are talking about, what these are actually funding. So that's a resource for all of you to refer back to as well. So starting off with what's what's the same from last year, uh, we do have an ongoing set of line items. This is what we call line items or activities. This is the third column in the budget. Um, very few are new. Um, they're very similar from last year. We also continue to organize them or cluster them around these tiers, the tier one, tier two, okay. tier three, and other. This again is inspired by Act 76, which did um, edit some language in 10 VSA 1389 in terms of how the Clean Water Board should prioritize funding. And so you'll see on the left, those highlighted little yellow boxes show you the tiering, and then all the way far on the right, those yellow boxes help you um, sum up the total dollars of the budget allocated to each tier. So there's a total dollars and then there's a percentage. And finally, the same thing or similar from last year is there's a summary table at the bottom and that helps you do subtotals by agency and department. So just to do a, a slight deeper dive into the tiering, just for your awareness, we did keep our aim for the same split as we did last year with 60% of the funds going towards the top priority or tier one funds, 30% to the second priority or tier two funds, and 10% to tier three or other. But that breakdown is across the full clean water budget, which includes, as we mentioned before, clean water fund, capital bill, and American Rescue Plan Act dollars. When you zoom in just into the clean water funds, specifically the base fund core funding column, it's a much more um, aggressive target on the tier one. So 80% of those funds are going towards top priority funding objectives or line items, 20% to tier two, and, and basically 0% to tier three and other. So now I'll pass it over to my colleague, Emily. Okay, and now I'm going to walk folks through the new elements that uh, are in this year's clean water budget. Building on what Nick had explained in terms of the operating statement, we are seeing quite a bit of uh, surplus revenue unallocated and unreserved that's coming to the bottom line of the clean water fund as a result of some pent up demand from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as some of the uh, federal stimulus dollars. And so we are acknowledging that those dollars need to be programmed into the clean water budget and put to good use. Uh, but we are going to be treating those dollars as one time funds. And I'll get into a little more detail about how we def we're defining base funds versus core funds this year. But just wanted to paint this picture for you here of how the clean water budget has really grown over time. And in the solid boxes, you can see some of our ongoing base funding from the clean water fund and the capital bill. The orange striped boxes represent American Rescue Plan Act dollars that are really should be treated as short term funding. 
And because this year is the final year, they're being handled as one time funds. And then we also have showing here the $10.8 million of, of the unallocated, unreserved clean water fund revenue that are actuals as of the close of state fiscal year 2022, and how we propose to program them across state fiscal year 24 and state fiscal year 25. Because in state fiscal year 25, we no longer have $10 million of ARPA, and there's going to be a contraction in the clean water budget. So the idea here is by spreading out those one-time funds across two state fiscal years, and there may potentially be additional one-time funds at the close of state fiscal year 23, our current fiscal year, then we could provide some stability to the clean water budget as we are contracting back some of these investments. And at the same time, Neil will speak to this a little later in the meeting. There is quite a bit of capacity building that's happening in terms of the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and being able to access additional federal investment through the bipartisan infrastructure law. So while we're going to be navigating this contraction here, we're also having efforts underway to try to build some capacity to access those federal dollars. I'm changing my slide, but there's a little bit of a lag time. Here we go. So with all of that context, just wanted to point out to folks that this year's budget, we have a new approach where we show the left-hand set of columns uh, with the, I believe it's a blue header, but it's kind of, or a green header, it's kind of hidden here, uh, that we are framing as base funds. And that includes the base clean water fund annual revenue projection and the base capital bill request, which typically ranges from 10 to $12 million a year. But this year we're proposing 10 million due to the availability of American Rescue Plan Act dollars. And so we show the, the subtotal of those base funds, which really offer, represents sort of smooth sailing, roughly annual revenue over the longer term. And then we have a cluster of columns to the right of that that represents one-time funds that are being programmed in a specific way that will enable the uh, contraction of the budget next year to go a little bit more smoothly. And then we show the total on the far right. Uh, I wanted to point your attention to the bottom line of the budget. There's a, a few cells that are highlighted here. This budget of the $10.8 million of unallocated unreserved revenue uh, that currently exists, we are proposing to allocate 4.9 million of that in state fiscal year 24, and then 5.9 million of it next year in state fiscal year 25. Uh, in order to support that kind of forward projection and provide some context about what we expect to be available next year, for the first time, we are also summarizing what we uh, project to be available in state fiscal year 25 across the bottom of the budget. Those are some new elements in the budget sheet related to base funds and one-time funds. And now I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail on the thinking here. Um, so the base funds in the state fiscal year 2024 budget, these represent uh, the clean water fund revenue projections that are not factoring in that short-term influx of revenue that we're handling as one-time funds, as well as the capital bill allocations. So the goal here is for these dollars to be maintained at about this funding level to provide uh, funding program stability that's in pace with program growth demands and long term in the long term where feasible without relying too much on those short term influxes of revenue and federal dollars to try to keep the growth of the fund in these programs at a sustainable level. And this is also critical for us to make sure we're continuing to maintain the non-federal match that's necessary to leverage ongoing for federal dollars. Um, so base funds uh, are being parsed out across the clean water fund and the capital bill using a few rules here, trying to maximize the use of the capital bill dollars for capital eligible activities, which have a little bit more limited eligibility compared to the clean water fund and use the maintain the clean water fund dollars to support non-capital eligible activities. And then capital bill dollars come with some additional strings attached. So we're trying to limit for administrative ease capital bill allocations to the fewest number of line items as possible. And then also uh, really reserving clean water fund dollars that can be most tightly aligned with this clean water fund statutory priority. So back to that pie chart that you saw earlier, 80% of the clean water fund dollars are going to those top tier priorities. 20% to the second tier and 
about half a percent this year for your other. So that's a little bit of background in our approach for the base funding. And then I'm just going to share our approach for one type fund. So we are fortunate to have this short term influx in funding that can be allocated, uh, but it is advised that we really consider these as one time funds so that we're not going to be growing our programs at an unsustainable pace and then have to navigate a, a contraction later down the line. So this year we have one time funds, $10 million in ARPA or American Rescue Plan Act, plus the $10.8 million of unallocated, unreserved clean water fund revenue. And when we were thinking about how to program these one time fund dollars, uh, we thought that programming it across the two state fiscal years would provide some additional stability as the clean water budget is uh, going to be ramping down slightly in the next couple of years with the sunsetting ARPA and also some leveling and slight decreasing in the projected revenues in state fiscal year 24 and 25. We're also targeting these dollars to fill discrete short term gaps um, in being able to provide non federal match to leverage short term federal funds. And then we're also targeting these funds to help fill gaps while we're ramping up our capacity to access the bipartisan infrastructure law or bill, federal funding and financing. And then finally, um, we're using these short term one time funds to establish uh, a new funding into the existing innovative and alternative technologies line item. Uh, and we'll get into our approach for that in a little bit but essentially populating that line item to a reserve level that can be replenished on an as needed basis. And then also we have a proposal for the board's consideration to increase the contingency reserve for the fund that helps guard against swings in revenue, which would also be replenished on an as needed basis. Okay, so that's the background on the base and the one-time fund. Next up, I'm going to give an overview of just some relatively simple updates to the line item for your situational awareness. So um, this year we are proposing to combine the water quality restoration formula grant and the complementary water quality restoration formula grant operation and maintenance line item into one line item to provide us with a little bit more flexibility in being able to allocate those dollars to their greatest need, acknowledging that the need for project implementation versus operation and maintenance could vary across watersheds. The other piece, we're targeting um, some new one-time funds into a new line item for VTRANS to provide the non-federal match to the Missisquoi Bay federal earmark, which will really provide some significant federal leveraging in that watershed to implement clean water projects. So that's an, a new line item this year. And then, as I mentioned before, we are we have had the innovative or alternative technologies or practices to improve water quality line item in the budget before, but it hadn't been populated because there were some pre existing funds that were already operating in this space. But this year we're proposing to use one time funds to populate this line item with $200,000 and then we would replenish it each year on an as needed basis. And acknowledging that there's a lot of work already happening in this space and a lot of other federal funding sources that are being leveraged to help in this space, we are proposing that this line item really targets the state match that is needed to leverage those other uh, resources in the innovation space um, through existing research initiatives and consortium. Um, and in this initial year of investment in the innovation space, we are proposing to use some of these dollars to support what we're calling the Vermont Lakes Alum Treatment Feasibility Study. And that will evaluate the feasibility of providing some alum treatments for some of Vermont's lakes that are really struggling with cyanobacteria blooms that are really being driven by legacy internal loading. There, a lot of work has already been done in the watershed to intervene on that phosphorus pollution, uh, but that there's still some hurting happening in the water because of that internal loading. So that is the proposal for this year's innovation. And then to continue, um, <laughs> this year we are also proposing an increase to the Lakes and Crisis Fund uh, from $50,000 a year to $120,000 a year. 
with the goal of these funds supporting the Lake Carmi water quality monitoring and aerator operations. Uh, the other thing to note is we're using one-time funds this year to provide some additional stormwater utility incentive payments. Um, most of the stormwater utilities have already received five years worth of these incentive payments. And so this is really helping to get us caught up to speed on St. Albans Town um, to provide them with three years worth of incentive payments since um, we did not, re <laughs> we failed to realize that uh, that was separate from the city. And so we will be kept getting them caught up to speed and, and then in future budgets working to secure the additional uh, payments each we made a policy decision um, last year that each community, once they establish a utility payment, would receive these incentive payments for five years. So that will get the town caught up to speed and then provide the remaining $25,000 uh, to the city to provide them with their final utility payments. And then finally, the uh, Agency of Commerce and Community Development has been uh, allocating some of the clean water fund dollars through their better connections and downtown transportation fund to help with downtown redevelopment projects to incorporate stormwater treatment practices into their planning and implementation. And due to the leftover prior year funds, uh, this program has requested a one year pause on this funding to give them some time to get those dollars out the door. And then we will reassess next year. And because we don't, we want to continue to be really mindful of our base funds versus our one time funds. We are not going to program that $200,000 um, savings into any other programs for this year, but we propose to let it fall to the bottom line, which you can see in the balance at the bottom. And then that will essentially roll into the unallocated unreserved funds to be programmed as one time funds in next year's budget. So I think that concludes the line item updates. And then the final update I wanted to share with you all um, is the proposed increase of, of the existing expenditure contingency reserve. So back in the early days of the Clean Water Fund, <laughs> there was uh, established a Clean Water Fund expenditure contingency plan. Currently, it's only half a million dollars. And at the time, that represented about 10% of the annual Clean Water Fund revenue. Because the Clean Water Fund has experienced a lot of growth, it used to be about $5 million a year. So the, this reserve is in place. It does not get allocated to any particular agency. It, it lives in the Clean Water Fund. And in the event that we have a downward swing in revenue, then it provides the fund with a safety net that we'd be able to tap into those funds without needing to take money back from agencies that are already implementing these programs. And so now that the Clean Water Fund has grown, oh, and I should say in the event that that would happen, the following state fiscal year would first replenish that risk reserves and then the remaining dollars would be programmed out across line items. So now that the Clean Water Fund has grown significantly and we're operating at about $25 million a year, this year's budget proposes adding $2 million to that reserve this would be a one-time investment. We wouldn't need to do this every year unless we end up needing to tap into it, which would mean in future years, we would replenish that balance. Um, so this $2.5 million contingency reserve would reflect about 10% of our annual revenue. And there is an additional use that we would like to uh, propose for uh, the risk reserve. We have a new water quality restoration formula grant that has been launched this year. And there is a provision in the rule for the clean water service providers that uh, there may be a risk reserve established if approved by the clean water board where that reserve would be able to be put into use to help to uh, repair or restore a clean water project and its associated phosphorus reduction value. And so we would like to come back to the clean water board at our February meeting with an updated proposal for this contingency plan that would enable this reserve fund to serve dual purpose of guarding against swings in revenue, as well as being able to be available uh, with some administrative steps to help partners on the ground access those dollars in the event that there is a act of God extenuating circumstance beyond anyone's control that we lose a clean water project that 
is important for providing a phosphorus reduction and needing to restore that. So more to come there. There's a lot of details to dig into, uh, but just wanted to give the Clean Water Board a preview that that's a work in progress. Okay, so that concludes my presentation of what's new in the Clean Water Budget this year. And next up, I'm going to hand it over to Rachel Wood on our team here who will be presenting for you um, our approach for managing the public comment period and its associated communications. Thank you, Emily. Next slide. First, I will walk through an overview of our approach to the public comment process this year. Some important dates that are, my colleague Gianna already mentioned at the beginning, but I'd like to reiterate here is the public comment period is open from October 24th through November 22nd. The public hearing will be held on Wednesday, November 2nd, and I will give a brief overview of the format for the public hearing at the end of this presentation. And the Clean Water Board will reconvene to address the public comment on December 7th. The Clean Water Board webpage is the central location to find a lot of these materials that I'll share today. And to stay informed about upcoming public comment process, please join the Clean Water Stakeholder Listserv if you have not already. We'll be sending out many helpful reminders about upcoming public meetings. I did just drop in the chat links to both of these. Public comment will be accepted via the online questionnaire through written submission to our anr.cleanwatervermont email as seen on the slide and or at the public hearing on November 2nd. Materials and educational tools that will be available for the public comment period are the Clean Water Budget Spreadsheet, which will show how much will go to each line item for state fiscal year 2024, the Clean Water Budget Overview, which is a PDF that provides a background and overview on the Clean Water Fund, the Clean Water Budget, and the Clean Water Board and line item summaries. And what I'll be walking you all through today and highlighted here is the online questionnaire and accompanying Clean Water Budget Story Map. To target input from the public each year, we try to structure this process with educational tools that will provide some background and introductory information before getting into the specific details of the budget allocations. In the feedback we received during last year's public comment, there was a common theme requesting we provide greater details and education around the Clean Water Board and budget with more examples of types of projects as work funds. So this year, to make, informative, to make information accessible, user-friendly, and interactive, the questionnaire is accompanied by a story map that provides greater detail and overview of the clean water funding in Vermont. The role of the Clean Water Board, the clean water budget process, as well as details about the state fiscal year 2024 budget with videos presented by agency partners who narrate descriptions of the budget line items by priority tier. This information will aid in providing the public with information about the budget and line items for the full length of the public comment period and be accessible on day one, so commenters will not need to wait partway through to have received this information. Having the pre-recorded presentation will also allow the November 2nd public hearing to be prioritizing hearing feedback from the public. And we plan to highlight and strongly encourage the public to review these story maps prior to submitting the public comment questionnaire. Next slide, yes. A draft version of the questionnaire that I will go over now is available in our meeting materials on pages 29 through 34. The questionnaire has two sections. The first section requests input on the allocation and prioritization of funds. The second requests feedback and participant demographics. This year, we approached the public comment questionnaire by taking into consideration feedback that we got we received during the state fiscal year 2023 public comment process. And one of the common themes within the feedback was to provide more opportunity for the public to write comments and recommendations within the questionnaire. And so this questionnaire is structured to better capture this type of feedback. The online questionnaire focuses questions that request public comment in the areas where the Clean Water Board decision making is happening. Next slide. The questionnaire starts by addressing whether the public feels there are sufficient funding to address priorities and to provide additional comments on funding and revenue levels. Following this multiple choice question, there's an area to provide comment, if applicable, on the Clean Water Fund revenue and funding levels that will be shared with the board. Next slide. The following questions are separated by priority tiers of the clean water budget. For each tier, there are three questions asking that start big picture, requesting feedback on the proportion of the funding to the tier, and then narrows down asking for comments or recommendations on overall allocation of funds within the tier, and then requests comments by specific line items. This pattern of questions is repeated for each tier, and tier three includes clean water board and other priorities as well. Next slide. 
Section two is requesting participants to share an evaluation of this year's public comment process and education materials to continuously improve in future years and adjust to better to, to better the participants' experience. The section also includes questions about participant demographics, such as how did you hear about this questionnaire and location to determine the effectiveness of our communications statewide. Next slide. Now, I'll just give a brief overview of the format for the public hearing. This public hearing will be on November 2nd from 8.30 to 10 a.m. and feature a showing of the Clean Water Budget line item presentation by agency partners from 8.30 to 9.10. In communication outreach, we'll strongly suggest the public preview this public hearing presentation before coming to the event, but wanted to offer a showing prior to the public comment portion in case anyone was unable to view or review the materials beforehand to ensure equal access to this information. The recording includes the background of the Clean Water Budget, the Clean Water Board process, an overview of the public comment process this year and how to engage in this process, the approach to the State Fiscal Year, State Fiscal year 24 Clean Water Budget and Risk Reserve, and is also followed by 30, 30 to 60 second presentations that were recorded by agency partners prior to the event. And this is all combined into one presentation in order by line item. And I want to say a quick thank you to all our agency partners for taking part in this process. It was really helpful to work with them. There will be a few moments to address any clarifying questions after the showing of the uh, presentation. And then from 9, 10 to 10, there will be 50 minutes reserved for public comment. A reminder to the public to please RSVP indicate in the RSVP if you'd like to comment. This gives us a better read on the volume of public comments that we'll be taking, and we can adjust the time allotted for public comment if needed. And the final slide, I believe, is just a quick overview of where this communications and publicization of this information will be. We'll include a, the, all this information at press release, post to our DEC social media platforms, Updates via our Clean Water Stakeholder Listserv and agency partners have volunteered to assist in spreading the word through their networks. Um, the Clean Water Board webpage and DC calendar events will also be kept up to date with this information as well. Oh, and I'm just going to jump back to the public hearing real quickly and just remind folks that this is a Clean Water Board public meeting the public hearing. So we really encourage our board members and agency staff to be in attendance if you are able. Um, and just to reiterate, we're really excited this year. I want to thank Rachel for the great work she's been doing to help make this public comment period more accessible. So uh, the the change this year is that we have a pre-recorded budget presentation that will be available on day one of the public comment period. So folks don't have to wait until halfway through to see this presentation at the hearing. They can view it at their at whenever is convenient for them and then come and share their, their live public comment at the hearing. And then we'll also provide the showing. So I just wanted to reiterate that point and and we believe this will be a hopefully a value add in trying to make this information more accessible this year. So thank you. I did see a raised hand real quick. Oh Jim, did you have your hand raised? Did you want to jump in? I think it was Jim. Yeah, I wondered if we're going to have a couple minutes to talk about the budget before we go to the public um, comment section. Um, sure, we this today's agenda, we were trying to lay out a lot of the, the context for the board. So we have just a couple more agenda items to get through that help provide context for the overall budget. And then um, if folks would prefer to have some discussion prior to public comment, perhaps we could entertain an adjustment to the agenda. We thought it might also be helpful for the public, for the board to hear the public comment prior to um, your discussion on the clean water budget so you could take the public comment into consideration. Um, but I, I welcome recommendations if you'd like to approach it uh, in a different way. Would that work for you, Jim, or um, should we oh, proceed? That, as that'd well? be fine. I just okay. like to leave five minutes for the board to discuss the budget either before or after the public comment section. Excellent. Yes, we have, I believe, at least 10 minutes on the agenda for that. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to hand it back over to Rachel Wood. Uh, so just to provide a reminder, last year we were going through this budget process and the Clean Water Board was really interested in the Clean Water Fund making an investment in innovative or alternative practices and technologies through that line item in the budget. This year we are populating that line item in the budget, but we also communicated to the board that we would work to compile some examples of how already woven throughout the budget there is innovation and alternative approaches that are being put into practice through our existing programs. So I want to thank Rachel for working across all the agency staff and for all the agency staff who submitted examples uh, for putting this information together for the board uh, awareness and consideration. Rachel, thank you. Can you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So within the meeting materials that were shared today, um, there's full summary of examples of the ongoing existing innovative or alternative technologies or practices that were submitted. Um, that's pages 35 to 41. If you'd like to look at these examples in more detail, I know the table is a little small to read. I will go over at a high level some examples of projects and highlight one of our partners, the Lake Champlain Basin Program's role in clean water innovation. Um, so the clean water budgets, innovative or alternative technologies or practices to improve water quality line item funds, innovative or alternative technologies or practices designed to improve water quality or reduce sources of pollution to surface waters. While this line item makes an explicit investment in research related to innovative or alternative technologies or practices, innovation is also integrated throughout many of the clean water budget supported programs and activities, as you can see in this table. So in this table, there are examples that agency partners submitted to show ongoing and existing innovative or alternative work that is supported by the clean water budget across state agencies. This ongoing and existing work will be taken into consideration to strategically target these new investments in innovative or alternative technologies and practices. Starting with the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, they submitted two amazing examples of this type of work. The first is a wood chip barnyard replacement project, which provides a cost effective solution for small livestock producers looking to improve winter management and reduce water quality impacts from winter heavy use areas. The wood chip barnyard replaces heavy use areas and contains a drainage layer overlain by wood chips that collects and diverts the effluent to a collection system. This innovative practice was first implemented in Warren, Vermont in 2016. The second Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets example is the Grassland Shallow Slot Manure Injection Program, which is funded by the Water Quality to Partners and Farmers line item. This project utilizes a rel relatively new technology that came from the Netherlands and is one of the first systems of its kind to be used in Vermont and provides a new method of manure injection so farmers can significantly reduce the surface phosphorus application in nutrient loss while increasing the efficiency and production of their crops. The next example is from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board and is supported by the Water Quality Farm Improvements and Retirement Project line item. The goal of the Farmland Retirement Program is to fund a buyout of farmland whose continued operation is especially detrimental to water quality. And in some cases, the funds the farmer receives from the sale of the land is a critical source of capital as they transition to retirement. This innovative state-funded conservation program focuses on retirement of farm parcels for the purposes of protecting and improving water quality. From Forest Parks and Recreation is the Road Erosion Inventory Project that is funded by the Implement Best Management Practices or BMPs at State Forest Parks and Recreation Access Road Line Item. This project adapts the municipal, municipal roads general permit road erosion inventory to assess hydrologically connected road segments on ANR land. The inventory scores and prioritizes best management practices to bring road segments up to standards for water quality. And finally, I'd like to highlight uh, a project from the Clean Water Initiative Program that is supported by the Program and Partner Support Line Item. The Clean Water Workforce Capacity Development Initiative invests in the people and organizations that help to get clean water projects on the ground. With relatively sudden increase in federal and state funds, QUIP wants to ensure that the state and our valued partners can effectively and sustainably meet the upsized demand for more clean water project development, design, implementation, and maintenance. QUIP's Capacity Development Initiative is innovative in both intent and form, as DSC, DEC has not directly invested in partner capacity to do this level of work before, and DEC is interviewing and soliciting input from the clean water workforce on capacity needs before designing the funding opportunities so that the program reflects better human-centered designs. I would also like to highlight one of our partners, Lake Champlain Basin Program, who is a lead partner in the state's clean water innovation 
work and clean water network. The Lake Champlain Basin Program's Technical Advisory Committee, or TAC, allocates federal funds to applied research efforts that support innovative or alternative approaches to achieving clean water goals, maintains and improves performance of ongoing efforts in Vermont and across the Lake Champlain Basin, leverages the expertise of professionals from academia, management agencies, and others, including representation from the state of Vermont, and presents technical information to be used for decision-making, advises about emerging management issues, and prepares research or action to address those issues. The state of Vermont provides non-federal match from the Clean Water Budget to assist the Lake Champlain Basin Program in securing its federal funds, including federal funds to support the tax objectives. This is important context when considering the Vermont Clean Water Budget's complementary role in supporting and leveraging resources for innovative or alternative technologies or practices. There's also a couple of examples in the materials about programs that the TAC has funded, one of which is overseeing a modeling study to evaluate options to control internal phosphorus loading in the Mythiscoy Bay, factoring the dynamics of the internal and external phosphorus pollution loading. And another example is the LCBT. LCDP TAC has funded and overseen the feasibility study in design of the Jewett Book Drew, Jewett Brook Treatment <laughs> Train. Now that is a tongue twister. This is an innovative approach under development and evaluation that it could address excessive nutrient runoff by installing a series of constructed wetlands to tr treat a proportion of the total flow of the Jewett Brook to remove phosphorus and to return the treated water to the stream. I would recommend everybody take a look at all of these great examples. And once again, thank you to all the partners that helped me do this work. Thank you, Rachel. Great job Sorry, compiling. Rachel. Okay, next up, I'm going to hand it over to oh, we oh, have a um, Bob Flint, has his hand raised. Yeah, very quick. And I appreciate that. And I also appreciate oh. saying Jewett Brook Treatment Train. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but as somebody who usually is is vocal about during the budget process about the innovation line and understanding pieces of this are embedded in, in within the agency's budgets as well, would love to see as um, data becomes available, revisiting these examples or others and saying, all right, before this was the case, after this is the case, we've reduced this much you know, impact. We've had this kind of an impact through this kind of approach. Because I, I guess, and, and we'll talk about the overall budget in a second or whatever, a few minutes, but I'm struck by the magnitude of it. And I'm struck by funding things year after year after year after year. Are they having the impact we want to have? And uh, through the, to me, the Vermont way is innovation and being clever and like the wood chip on the barnyard thing. I think that's great. Um, are there other things, obviously, in, in different scales that we can do? And maybe when it comes time to talk about the budget, we look at doing a little more than 200,000 in that specific line item, but just I'm being long winded. The, I guess the point being is that at some point, I would love to see the impact of some of these innovations in data. Thank you. Excellent. Yes, I think it would be great to bring that feedback to our interagency work group and maybe come up with some ideas of how we could synthesize those outputs for you to consider. Uh, the good news is we have our annual performance report, which also uh, does its best to capture the results of those investments. But it would be interesting to con compile um, the innovative components in one place and, and analyze. So that's a great point, Bob. Thank you for your feedback. Any other questions? Um, I'm going to hand it over to Neil Kamen. And he is the director of the Water Investment Division to provide the board with an overview of the federal funding landscape, which is also important context as we are planning our clean water budget. Thank you, Neil. Would you like me to share your slides first? Sure, that would be great. If you wouldn't mind, that way I don't have to do the drive. And while, while you're teeing that up, I appreciate your comments a lot, Bob. I really do. And that technical advisory committee that Rachel mentioned actually is a committee that I chair. So I'm in a privileged um, position to know just how, you know, the magnitude and breadth of the work that is un undertaken. And basically, it, they, the, our group is constantly funding innovations across multiple sectors, stormwater and agriculture and, and, and. And it's pretty exciting um, stuff. And be happy to have a one-on-one -on -one if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that. 
any time. Um, I may have misinterpreted a little bit my charge. Um, I'm going to talk to you very briefly about the federal, the, what we call the federal funds report, which is a report that's required under your statute, uh, 1389A, which is the reporting part of the Clean Water Fund and the Clean Water Board. But I'm very, um, I'm, I'm certainly able to drill into some of the details of some of the larger federal funds that um, drive the figure that you're going to see in the next slide. Um, this is a fairly short form report with a lot of information in the back end in an appendix. It's a tabular accounting of how much federal funds go to each state agency and also flow through different federal agencies into Vermont. Um, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a beast to put together. There's a lot of phone work involved in asking folks to participate, and you know your the agencies whom report to to you all on the board who are agency leads are are great partners in putting this information together. Uh, it goes beyond just the agencies to assemble these these data that are in here. Um, so we prepare this report to get it to joint fiscal uh, by September 1st of each year. That's the statutory charge, and that allows joint fiscal to have an idea of how much federal money is coming in as they craft the subsequent year budget. So when we are reporting the federal funds report, we're actually reporting uh, federal funding cycles. So the most recent federal year that we're reporting is federal fiscal 22. Obviously, we're spending in state fiscal 23 and we'll be crafting state fiscal 24. Um, so we're always a bit of a lag here, but it gives us better situational awareness and it frankly takes a while for federal money to get all the way into the states and make its way to the agencies. Um, this catalogs the best we can um, all of the incoming federal funds that are intended to fund projects that are in the purview of the Clean Water Board and, and meet the um, meet the intent of the act for the fund. And we started doing this work in 2017 with sort of an interim report and the first actual uh, full published report was 2018. They're all on uh, the Clean Water Initiative website. That little QR code that you see in the upper right hand code, you can pull your phone out right now, take a picture of it and you will get access to the report. And I've written the link out in the next slide. So, um, this report catalogs federal funds that flow into Agency of Ag, Food and Markets, into Agency of Natural Resources, and into VTrans. It also catches, when we can, uh, funds uh, that go to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that are likely to be spent in Vermont, funds that go to USDA Rural Development that fund clean water infrastructure projects, think wastewater, um, funds that go through the Lake Champlain Basin Program that don't necessarily then cycle into the state, but are administered independently. And then newly in the last couple of years, uh, because these are huge new federal funding sources, the American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or BILL have been uh, included in this accounting of funds. So Emily, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, um, this is really the, the, the take home punchline um, since 2018, fiscal 17 up to fiscal 22. Um, you can see the growth in federal funds over time. The, uh, you know, starting at just under 40, about $35 million in fiscal 17 federal, about flat fiscal 18, and then beginning to grow in 19 and 20, and then growing substantially in 21 with the first uh, infusion of ARPA state fiscal recovery funds that were directed into water and sewer projects for clean water. And then a big jump in FY22, reflecting the General Assembly's appropriations of those ARPA dollars and also new bipartisan infrastructure law funds coming into Vermont. Um, the importance and magnitude of ARPA and Bill. The state is running a number of programs, obviously, across multiple agencies for both of those uh, federal laws. But when we kind of look just in the lens of uh, clean water related infrastructure that's relevant to 1389, um, about $96 million of ARPA money across uh, state fiscal 22 and state fiscal 23 uh, are captured by the FY21 and 22 bar. And then about $26.4 million of bipartisan infrastructure law money. It would take way more than five minutes to decipher it all for you and kind of lay it out all in a matrix. However, in the back end of the report, and that report is now linked in this slide as well, um, 
you can see the full accounting and again as best we're able to put it together based on our situational awareness so um happy to take any questions about that i think maybe i'll just close by echoing something that nick uh had said earlier about kind of the longevity this big huge bump in federal funds cannot expect that this will perpetuate um and so you know very likely that we will kind of over time meter out these bipartisan infrastructure law funds the arpa dollars will spend down into the projects that they're funding and we'll kind of tail back down into what i imagine will be a more normal clean water fund revenue stream so thank you Emily or Secretary Moore, anything else on that or anybody? Thank you for providing that context and it's helpful to see this ramping up of federal funds while we're anticipating a contraction in the clean water budget and just know that kind of behind the scenes we're working to build some capacity on how we can pivot some of the demand from clean water budget into maximizing the use of these federal dollars, put them to, to good use and ensure that leveraging and coordination is occurring. So I wanted to provide that context for the board. Thank you, Neil. Okay, Thank you, I'm gonna Emily. stop sharing the screen and I believe that brings us to the public comment portion of the agenda. Yes, and we have about 11 folks who have signed up ahead of time to uh, comment. So we're going to try our best to dedicate 20 minutes um, to this and then 10 minutes for the Clean Water Board to uh, discuss the draft budget. Um, so hopefully we can wrap up by four o'clock. Um, so Doug, if you agree, I typically might set a timer for two minutes per commenter just to ensure everybody has time to say their piece. Uh, and I will be calling upon folks who have signed up first and then if and then if there's additional folks who didn't sign up that would like to, to let us know, please raise your hand or indicate that in the chat. Yeah, okay, I think two so minutes will be fair. Oh, yeah, that works, especially with Jim wanting time to talk about the budget among the board members at the end. So thank you. Well, thank you. I'm just going to get my timer set up here. And first up, we have Sylvia Knight. Sylvia, and this one's moving. And occasionally folks are not able to join us, so we may end up with checking to see if she is here. It appears she was not able to join us. So on to the next person is Pat, and I apologize if I um, pronounce those incorrectly. Swazi. Yes, Swazi. Thank you. Um, oh, Swazi. Thank you. Bob. Bob. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Bob Flynn pretty much touched on my question. My, my question really um, was about um, funding for long-term um, research on the outcomes of many of these projects, um, and particularly on those projects that need to be maintained. I mean, you mentioned in the innovative listing, say, you know, um, wood chips and, you know, for cattle, but that's something that has to be maintained over the long term. So I was just wondering about, is there funding available or funding set aside to ensure that, you know, over the years, these projects get looked at again um, and reviewed and determined, is there really a long-term outcome? Is it worth doing these kinds of projects? And also with that data and information is, publicly available if it's being done and if it's going to be done will it be publicly available thanks if it would be helpful i could just briefly respond to pat's question there that we are now um, investing funds from this budget to support the long-term operation and maintenance and verification of ongoing projects and so we will be working as we start to invest in that space to gather data on what the findings are. And those data could also help inform where there's additional capacity building or research needed to ensure these projects are being able to sustain and perform long term. So that's a very new program that we're just working on getting um, piloted and, and set up and would be happy to report back to the board in the future with a little more information on that. Thank you, Pat. Appreciate thank, your thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, next up is John Costa, who is here in the room with us today. Um, John sent some written comments ahead of time, which we will include in the public uh, meeting minutes. Apologies, my timer's going off. Um, okay, I don't know what's going on, sorry. <laughs> okay, let's stop. Um, and I have some visuals that I will put on the screen while uh, from, from John while you're sharing your remarks, if that still works. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Clean Water Board members, and also especially Secretary Moore. My name is John Costa, and I'm here appearing before you today representing Lake, the Lake Conway Campus Association and indirectly the Lake Conway State Park, the Franklin Watershed Committee, and all of the people in and out of Vermont who visit Lake Conway in Franklin each year. Based on what I've heard today, I will try to keep my remarks brief, but with the conditions facing Lake Carmi, brevity is difficult, especially when one considers that public and private agencies have been studying and testing Lake Carmi for nearly 30 years. In fact, I recently stumbled across a banner on the side of a barn near the lake that reads, Franklin Watershed Committee, caring for Lake Carmi since 1996. In actuality, the Watershed Committee started, was founded in 1994. So you, I think most of you know, Lake Kame is the only Vermont is Vermont's only designated lake in crisis, and it received that des designation following serious cyanobacteria outbreak in 2017. But if you've never visited our little lake on the Canadian border, then you have, then you have not not experienced what a gem you have in northwestern Vermont. Not only does it sit within a mile or two of the border, but Lake Kame is a mere 20 minute drive away from Lake Champlain. Ironically, if there was conversations tonight about the Mississippi, Mississippi uh, Basin, ironically, Kamai happens to feed Lake Champlain by way of the Pike River. But our lake continues to decline in its water quality. This summer, we experienced blue-green algae blooms that started in late June and continued right into the fall. Our beaches were closed for months. Our property owners have been plagued with thick, a thick slime that extended into the middle of the lake Good picture right there. Um, our town residents have been unable to use the lake. The state park has seen, certainly seen a decline in use. The local economy has surely been negatively impacted by the poor water quality of our lake. If you haven't, if you have not visited our lake during a cyanobacteria bloom, then you haven't seen or smelled the devastation that is fast becoming the norm for Lake Carmi. Vermont is often compared to Switzerland for its beauty with its rolling hills, mountainous terrains, and mountainous terrain. Only those who spend significant time in Vermont know its dark secret. Vermont's lakes, rivers, and streams, not only just Lake Carmi, are suffering from years of neglect. And you've seen the, the results of some of that up there. Four years ago, the first significant step in addressing Lake Carmi came with the installation of a lake-wide aeration system. Fortunately, to date, Aeration does not appear to be the actual answer. And as of my presentation today, the 2022 aeration results are not yet available. However, for those of us living on the lake, no statistics are needed as the lake began to, to release its dangerous toxins in late June and never let up for the remainder of the season. Now we can stay out of the water during blooms. We can try to keep our pets out of the, out of the water. For those of us who still draw water from the lake, there are limited alternatives. We just don't have access to water. Those who live close enough can just go home. But for the many retirees living on the lake who go to warmer climates in the off season, there is no alternative. However, there is a larger and more serious issue at hand. What we cannot avoid is the air we breathe. New evidence is pointing to serious health risks when it comes to breathing air surrounding cyanobacteria blooms. A water quality scientist who visited the lake earlier this summer indicated that the air within a half mile of the bloom can be unhealthy to bloom, to breathe. I come here today thankful for the work that's been done to date, concerned that we could lose the decades long battle to save this precious gem. In an effort to support our work, we we're asking for the following. And I have a list of things here uh, that I could either read in or there is a list that, that you received a letter from. Do you want me to just refer to that list? Or do you want to read the list? No, I I, I think we, we have it. And frankly, I hope you see that a number of them are reflected. I, stood, I was going to, I've already made notes. <laughs> so, I, 
So I'm going to skip that list because you've already said interactive, but please, I can't emphasize enough, enough, enough to the water board that we need to allocate the funds now, or at least reserve the funds now, because if we don't reserve them now, then they may never, never, never be available again. Closing, Lake Harmony was an integral, is, was an integral part of my wife, Carol, and my retirement plans. Spending summers on our beautiful lake, then returning home to Massachusetts, the winter. Our retirement dreams have become our greatest nightmare as we struggle to decide what to do with our remaining years. All of us who enjoy the beauty of the, the Vermont, and in particular, Lake Harmony offer, ask that you allocate the appropriate funding outlined that's in the outline so that we can all enjoy the benefits of life on our once happy lake. I'd like to leave you with a quote from Bud Schuster, who represented the Pennsylvania in the Senate House of Representatives in, from 1973 to 2001. Clean water is not an expenditure of federal funds. Clean water is an investment in the future of our country. The only other thing I would add is I noticed that you have a 10 point something million unallocated, unreserved. Can I put my first dibs in for some of that? Otherwise, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Costa. Appreciate your comment. Okay, oh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Next up, we have Jennifer Byrne. It does not appear that she is in attendance, so we'll move on to our next commenter. Uh, Caroline Gordon. Perhaps she's Next up is Peter Benevento. I believe Peter is here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Hello. Uh, I'm Pete Benevento. I'm president of the Lake Carmine Campus Association, and I also am vice president of the Franklin Watershed Committee. And I've been involved uh, with water issues at Lake Carmi for the past 15 plus years. Uh, this year was by far the worst year that we've had experience that I've experienced with blue-green algae. And we urge the assistance of the, of the Clean Water Board. Um, John gave you a good presentation of, of what we experienced over the course of the year. But please know that Vermont is the fourth largest inland lake in Vermont. It's also the home for 311 camps, and Lord knows what that translates into the people population. And that doesn't include the people that visit the Lake Carmi State Park, which is the largest state park in Vermont. And for the health and integrity of the, of the people who visit Lake Carmi, and for the integrity of the Vermont brand that is beauty and is environment and is, and is green, but green for the mountains and not for the water, please, we urge that you, you, you help us and find a solution to this problem um, because we can't let the lake, we can't lose the lake. Again, we got the fourth largest lake in Vermont. We can't lose it. We've been working at it for years. And now we see a, an influx of federal funds that can be used to help the lake to, to finally rid us of this, of this terrible problem. So again, um, we urge you to, to assist us in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benevento. Okay. Next up is Bruce McGurk. Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd echo both Mr. Costa and Mr. Benevento's uh, sentiments. Uh, I noted the increase in funding for continued lake aeration. Uh, the uh, Franklin Watershed Committee very much appreciates your support. Uh, I do feel that it is critical that the alum feasibility study be expanded and uh, very much include Lake Carmi in addition to uh, parts of uh, Missisquoi Bay and uh, Lake Champlain. I think as a 1,500-acre surface, we are a, a wonderful test case for examining if that kind of treatment would lock up our legacy phosphorus. We've successfully reduced input to the lake now, but we're stuck with years of accumulation. So uh, 
We really need your help and we appreciate the help that you've demonstrated. Thank you very much. And I apologize if I neglected to, to state that the alum feasibility studies intended to address Lake Carmi and possibly other Vermont lakes. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Apologies if I missed that earlier. I may, I think I may have. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Um, next up, I have Ernest. There was no last name provided. There's not to be here. Um, Melissa Costa, is that your wife? Daughter. Or your daughter? <laughs> Melissa Costa, are you in attendance? Would you like to comment? Does not appear to be here. Okay, back to my list, apologies. Um, next up uh, is I'm, David. I'm sorry, I'm here. I'm oh, er hi. Ernie Engelhardt, party. I'm <laughs> apologize. Oh, hi, Ernie. <laughs> yeah, hi. Thank you for joining us. I apologize. I didn't make the connection. Well, I pushed the, I pushed the wrong button twice, so that's the way things go here. Anyway, I just wanted to um, emphasize uh, what Pete and John spoke about Lake Carmi. Um, it, it is a it continues to be a real uh, disappointment for uh, an awful lot of people up there who have purchased camps there and have stayed there and have expected something very, very different than what we have been experiencing. Um, as far as we can tell from at the ag in the town, campers and others are doing what they can do. Um, but the lake is talking to us and telling us that it's not enough. We really do need help. Wherever we get federal funds, we need any sort of innovative ideas that people may have on how to help Lake Carmi. Um, and I think that's I think that's all that I really need to say. You know, we just uh, we just need help. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ernie. Um, and. I, well, next on our list, I, next on our list um, Pat has her hand up as well. I'm getting confused back. Sorry. Um, okay. I'm going to uh, finish going through the list of folks who signed up to comment ahead of time, and then I will circle back to you, Pat. Um, if, let's see. So next up, we have Diane and David LaRose. Oh, can you show a picture too? Hello everyone, uh, my name is Diane LaRose and I have been a part-time resident of Lake Carmi for my entire life. And um, my biggest concern with uh, living on the shores of Lake Carmi are the potential health impl implications for myself, my husband and my family. Um, my question today is it looks like you are considering a feasibility study for an alum treatment in uh, 2024. Every year that we wait is another year lost for us and another year that we're putting ourselves at potential harm. So I'm just curious as to whether there are any kind of emergency funds or any place where money could be secured so that we could move the process ahead a little bit because if we if we have a feasibility um, study in 2024, the earliest we would be able to see an alum treatment would be 2025. So uh, that's just my concern that I'd like to share. If there's any way that we could move that feasibility forward, that'd be great. Thank you for your comment. Um, and also just to clarify, it's this is these dollars would be available. July 1st of 2023 um, and and we could hopefully strategize with our team here to try to get everything lined up and ready so that as soon as those dollars are authorized by the legislature that we could get the procurement process rolling um, and we may circle back to see if there's any additional approaches we can use to expedite that that process. 
Well, that would be great. Thank you so much. I love hearing that. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Um, okay, and that concludes, I believe, the list of folks who signed up to comment ahead of time. If, um, I see Pat has her hand up. Um, it, we probably have time for maybe one or two more, and then we should um, move on to the next agenda item. So, Pat, would you like to? Um, sure. Thank you. Just a quick comment. I want to thank Pete Benevento and everybody from Lake Carmi for really, you know, raising um, this really serious issue. And I, I wanted to mention that um, Lake Mori has also been suffering for from a lengthy cyanobacteria bloom this summer. Um, and I think that raises a lot of red flags um, of concern. What's going on? Um, you know, it's not I mean, Lake Carmi certainly is the worst and needs the most attention and we fully support that. But um, it's happening elsewhere, and it's something we really need to look at. And that's part of why my earlier question about, you know, really studying outcomes and really doing the research, because we have to understand much better what actually works. Um, so that's, I just wanted to mention that and not forget that um, it's happening elsewhere as well. And we're very concerned about that. Thanks. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, and then finally, I, I see Kathy Sampson, you have your hand up and then uh, so we'll we'll take your comment and then um, conclude this agenda item. Many yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. So I wasn't going to say anything. Um, this, I'm kind of new to the committee and uh, but I really have to just point out something in agreement with all those wonderful statements I've heard from others from Lake Carmi. Um, my family has been there for generations and Although I don't right now reside in Franklin, I mean my family's been there since my grandfather, and they are the one one of the ones of the main, the group that kind of paved the dirt road to go out there. They used to just camp on the lake, so I have memories of as uh, you know a one two year old three year old swimming in clean water there and just being able to jump in the lake whenever you wanted, and and th those memories are so important to me and my family. And that is something that I'll never forget. And that Franklin has always been home to me. And the reason I'm, I'm saying something now is I just, I'm hearing what everyone is saying. And I, I need to stress to you how important it is for the economy and for the environment and for the people, but also just for the gift that we need to give back to that area and the lake. Um, to keep it clean. And mistakes were made in the past, sure. You know, we, we didn't always remember how to treat the earth the best. I remember as a small child jumping off the dock and, and washing ourselves in the lake. That's what your parents told you back then, take a bar of soap and jump in. We didn't know better, but we know better now. And people are trying to make amends and make this a better place, but there's only so much we can do. And I know you're hearing us and I know you're, you, you wanna help and I know that. But I look at the money that you allocated on there and I think to myself, there's got to be more. There's got to be more somewhere in that unallocated that maybe we can be top tier one because it's a really important thing to get that lake clean. It, it, it was just so horrible this year. You cried every day looking at it. And so thank you for listening to us. Thank you for hearing that we need the money. But I'm going to beg you to find some more and I'm going to beg you to find a little bit more way to help us because we're doing what we can, but we really, really need you. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Appreciate that. Okay. Thank you to all who have attended and uh, shared your comment with the Clean Water Board. Um, now is the final agenda item for the board to discuss the draft budget recommendation um, and the public comment online questionnaire. Uh, for your consideration and approval before we post for public comment. Are there any questions or discussion regarding the budget? Yeah, I'll start Online. off, Emily. Um, oh, sorry, I'll go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I just want to start off by asking members of the committee, um, are there any of you that can uh, can stay for or can any of you not stay for an additional five minutes to to I'd like to, to extend by five minutes if if you can't do that i see a lot of nodding heads so i'm going to assume if we can maintain a quorum for an extra five minutes uh, i just want to do that 
And then I want to just put a a word of caution or warning out there that although the funding picture looks positive in, in increasing the additional federal funds, I think some of that is going to be netted out by increasing costs and basically an inflationary pressures that are going to result in the same amount of money delivering a smaller amount of results. And so I think that, that we're facing this in many areas across state government, and it's definitely something we should expect now. The inflationary pressures are different in every sector, so there's no like scaling factor that, that we can just apply to, to anticipate it. But I do want the members of the board just to be cognizant of that, that you know, even if we receive more money, um, the results are not going to scale directly to the, to those um, based on the the trend that we're seeing at the national and federal level. Um, so it's it's important for us to still deploy that money with the same priorities. Um, but you know, in prior years where we didn't have inflation, we, more money was just a, a direct boon and directly proportional. And we're not in that situation right now, unfortunately. So sorry, that was my my opening thoughts. <laughs> I didn't mean to step on you there before, Chad, if you've got comments. Uh, no, I just wanted to say that I'm fine with the uh, questionnaire. I like the new format, anything that makes it easier for people to use. And uh, and thank you. You know, you're right for that caution there, Secretary Farnham. Um, but, you know, we are uh, five million dollars more than we where we were last year as well. Um, we're still up. Yeah. Yes, we're still up, which is a good sign. And I and I agree. I think some of these things are going to uh, you know, we're not going to see this once 10 million is a big chunk that's going to disappear. And I love the idea of spreading that out over the next two years. Um, you know, but we hear from Lake Armai a lot. And um, I noticed that they went up to 120,000 from 50,000 in um, in their funding. And I know you've probably explained this to me a number of times, um, but uh, Julie, but the 50 was basically a placeholder, correct? It triggered funding that was used to leverage more funding for lakes in crisis is the 120,000 now. Does that mean that triggers more money or is it just more money to start with? Yeah, so the, the $50,000 is the minimum prescribed by statute for the, the lakes in crisis fund. It doesn't come close to representing the sum total of the amount from the clean water fund that's being invested in Lake Carmi. Uh, that said, there were requests made for two specific items that felt like they sort of fit under what I think of as the umbrella of the lakes in crisis, the intention of the lakes in crisis, which is the enhanced monitoring we're doing in Lake Carmi um, to sort of verify and, and frankly learn from the aeration that's being piloted there, and then the ongoing costs associated with the operation of the aeration system. So that $120,000 is is intended to reflect the statutory minimum and be inclusive then of those two specific items to Lake Carmine. Um, so how does that, that seems tough because you're asking uh, people on a lake in crisis to hang with us while we study why it's in crisis, um, which kind of makes it tricky, I would think. I don't know, like what's your, what's, do we have a time frame with that? Like how, how long do we feel we need to go? I mean, the word in Franklin County is that the aeration system was kind of a bust. It didn't really work, but I don't know if it wasn't working properly. I don't know how much studying has been happening, but what is that window? We're talking about more funding possibly being or funds being freed up by next uh, July. I think I heard correctly. It'd be nice to know that obviously or have some information. So we're not throwing money down the drain either, but um, that seems it's tough to ask people to be a, a Petri dish. Sure. So I'll start and then I see Oliver Pearson, who's the head of our Lakes and Ponds program is also on and maybe we'll pitch it to him for some additional detail. Um, but the, the we have one year of true operation of the aeration system, although it's been in place for I think three full summers at this point, it had rather significant operating glitches the first two years um, that we think compromised its efficacy. So. Uh, at this point, I, I wouldn't say one year of data is sufficient to sort of tell us that we know everything there is to know about the aeration system. It is sufficient to cause us to ask questions about whether it, it will be possible for that system to keep up with the internal loading within the lake 
And that's part of the reason we've included funding in the FY24 budget for these alum feasibility diagnostic feasibility studies, which seems like it could be a, a companion measure or perhaps a, a, a replacement measure for the aeration system. But I think it's we, we sort of need to do both, to walk and chew gum at the same time, continue to evaluate the aeration system, and if there are potential modifications, as well as look at um, how an alum treatment might be used in Lake Carmi to either augment or replace. And with that, I flip it to Oliver and let him correct anything I may have, have misstated or, or add to it. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Secretary Moore. Uh, no, no corrections needed. Um, happy to speak to the members of the, the Clean Water Board. Just would make two points. One is that you know, in 2018, when we were coming up with potential solutions to address the cyanobacteria blooms and the high phosphorus concentrations in Lake Carmi, we considered alum. And at that point, we hadn't really reduced the external loading of phosphorus from the watershed to the point where alum would be a cost effective investment. Since then, DEC, Agency of Agriculture, other partners have made great strides. And in 2021, we met the TMDL target for reductions in phosphorus loading to Lake Carmi based on our estimates of how many acres had received BMP practices. So, so that's good news. That, that's, that's a positive change for the lake. We also have learned a lot uh, through the, the high frequency monitoring that we've done over the last two years and have a better sense now that it's really internal loading during the last three hot, dry summers that's fueling the cyanobacteria bloom that the lake's been suffering from. Both internal and external loading play a part, but when it's hot and dry, you, there's a clear signal that the, the, the hot, dry conditions lead to sediment phosphorus release, even with the aeration in place, which leads to bloom. So we do need to, to walk and chew gum at the same time, and we are continuing to experiment and try to learn from it. But I think the folks up in Lake Carmi understand that this is unique. There's never been a lake as large as, as Lake Carmi that's received an aeration system in the United States. So we're, we're just the whole approach to try to remediate phosphorus at this scale is, is somewhat experimental. But what I think we'll do in 2023 is use some of these lakes and crisis funds, if, if they're approved by the board and the legislature, to reposition some of the compressors that pump oxygen into the lake, target the deepest parts of the lake where there's the most uh, sediment phosphorus release. And we've, we've learned and also the, where the sediment is that has the highest concentrations of phosphorus, and we've learned those things from our monitoring, and see if reconfiguring the aeration system has any benefits in 2023. Simultaneously, we hope to do that alum feasibility study. An alum treatment could cost you know upwards of a million dollars, perhaps even more, for a lake the size of Carmi. So I think we do need to study and make sure that it's going to be cost effective, a good use of resources, that it'll achieve the desired impact before we move ahead too quickly and try to seek funding for that purpose. So we may be back in front of the Clean Water Board in a year looking for funding for an alum treatment, but it'd be nice to be able to say we've studied it, we know quantitatively that it's it's a viable solution for these reasons, and this is the dosage we need. These are the acres of, of the lake that need to be treated, and therefore the cost is, is X. So that's really our goal for 2023. I, I really take your point. The frustration for the, the residents of, of Lake Carmi and Franklin County is, is palpable. We had a Carmi coordination quarterly meeting a couple of weeks ago, and folks really made it clear that they want solutions yesterday. And I think our, our plan for 2023 is, is not that, but it's the best we can do under the circumstances. Secretary, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Oliver. Could I just uh, to tag on to that for a second? And, and, and Oliver, your comments are great. As a, as a layperson, um, I sort of understand intellectually what's going on, but I'm not a scientist. Uh, I don't pretend to be. It would be really interesting for me, at least, to, to sort of dedicate some time at a, at a future meeting to really, uh, for the layperson, understand what's happening, why it's happening, what the hell is an alum treatment, you know, and, and, and why would it or not work? What does aeration do not do? And just to help us get our arms around the issue. So as we're, we're contemplating possible expenditures uh, to, to, you know, echo the, the, the sound judgment you folks are making as scientists and, and state officials to, to recommend this as the best course of action. I was a little taken aback by the, the person from the public's comment about Lake Maury. And um, if indeed there's a similar phenomenon happening there, as well, um, truly understanding the science behind this, understanding there are probably going to be more hot summers in our futures, 
So how do we best uh, caretake and remedy these situations? Thanks. Yeah, just brief response. Happy to either at a Clean Water Board future meeting or at another forum do a bit of a 101 on, on alum and aeration and what, what works, what doesn't. You know, Lake Maury had a alum treatment in 86 and for about 30, 35 years that was very effective in reducing loading to the lake in blooms because of just locking up uh, the, the phosphorus that's worn off. We, we got great mileage out of the treatment there because it was complemented by good work in the watershed to reduce the external loading of phosphorus. So those two go hand in hand. But Maury, as as was said, both uh, the, the the alum treatment seems to have worn off. There was there was a hot dry summer, an extended bloom. So what's driving that? Um, and so that that the innovation line item that that Emily and the secretary mentioned, you know, if 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 that's approved and if the board is amenable, we might look at studying the feasibility of of a second alum treatment in in Maury in addition to the a potential first treatment in in Carmi, but that's that's just hypothetical at this point. Thank you. I'd be happy to follow up with Oliver offline to figure out a venue to provide some of that information to the board. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Oliver. Any other questions or recommendations from the board for us to consider in the budget? Uh, I, 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 we're doing with the Oops, and what we're doing with the American Rescue Plan. Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you now. OK, I don't know. I live out at the end of the line and could have network issues. Um, but I'm a little concerned with. Um, so we're carrying over, as I understand it, almost six million dollars surplus from 22 to 25 to mitigate. But then we're also reserving $2 million in contingency. And I'm a little concerned about labeling something as contingency. I don't think there's any statutory um, discussion about, you know, saving money as contingency. I, you know, the governor can propose a budget, but the legislature gets the final say. So one of the things that Secretary Farnham was just saying to me was, or saying to all of us was, you know, the concern about inflationary pressure. So I would like to see that $2 million labeled as something other than it looks like it just dropped to the bottom line and with language notwithstanding can disappear any place else in the state budget. So um, maybe, a uh, contingency for inflationary pr pressure or something else. I just don't like two million dollars open ended um, dropping to the bottom line. I, I think that's a, a valid concern, Jim, and that's certainly something as Emily indicated, we're going to bring a, a updated policy on the reserve back to the board at the February meeting and we can can be much more thoughtful about the the words we use to describe it um and it it goes beyond just an inflationary reserve there there's language in act 76 i believe the rule um the rule okay the rule that that we developed following act 76 around clean water service providers and having um funding available should there be a catastrophic natural event to replace or um maintain practices that may be damaged as a result. And we'll we'll bring that information into this updated policy too. But but point well well taken that 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 label is may may end up being a disservice to our goal. Thank you. I just uh Doug before before we close, I would just like to offer my thanks to this team. It is 
and they, they walk through the budget in, in 30 minutes time today, but that reflects hours and days and weeks and frankly months of work to get us to that point. Um, it's incredibly complicated. I think hopefully folks got a sense for today, the myriad of funding sources that are being brought together, our ability to leverage federal funds on top of the unprecedented state dollars we have available to us, working with partner organizations to understand the resources they bring to bear. And I just want to say thank you. That this is a lot of work. Thank you, Secretary Moore. Appreciate that. Yeah, I, I definitely echo that. And I'd also like to thank all the members of the board for giving us some extra time. I I said five minutes, you gave me 10. So I really appreciate <laughs> um, everyone's time. And uh, I think if that concludes our formal business today, anything I'm missing, Emily? Uh, just the, uh, the action for the budget approval to post for public comment. There's a draft motion in the agenda. Yeah, I, I would uh, move to post the draft SFY 2024 clean water budget for public comment as presented today. Can I have a second? second that. Thank you, Joe. All right, should we? I forget. It's been a while. Do we call roll for this? And you can just all those in favor. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. All those opposed? All right, motion passes. Thank you all for attending the October 18th meeting of the Clean Water Board. That concludes our formal business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you on November 2nd for the public hearing. <laughs> Second. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. And